<laughs> Welcome. Lovely to see you here, and it's lovely to see our friends uh, online. Chris, you'll be uh, delighted to know that we have uh, one watcher from Ontario, and we'll watch the space to see. We might even have someone from Kent, who knows. Welcome to uh, the English language in Kent, 597 to 2022, part of the Splendid Heritage Open Days program in 2022. I'm mindful that we're in a period of mourning, occasioned by the death of Queen Elizabeth, but hopeful that a talk such as this feels an appropriate event. And besides, you're here, which is encouraging. My name is Bill Lucas. I'm a professor of learning at the university and chair of the English project. And it's my privilege to introduce Chris and just to say a few words about the English project. The English project promotes awareness and understanding of the global story, or stories perhaps, of English in all its varieties. We try to prevent, present these ideas about English in an intelligent, cue Christopher, in an intent, entertaining, also cue Christopher, and an inclusive way, also cue Christopher. Our big idea is to create the first ever museum for the English language here in Winchester for reasons that may be obvious for many of you, but if they're not, something to do with Alfred and the birth of the English language. And we're making exciting progress towards that. Last night we were guests of Hampshire Cultural Trust for a very exciting evening here. Uh, watch this space, but there's a new immersive experience to be launched later in November, and we're very hopeful that this will be a placeholder, a beginning, a first step along the way towards having a fantastic visitor attraction here in Winchester. It's a novel partnership with Assassin's Creed. It's possible you don't know what Assassin's Creed is. It's a computer game. Uh, and it's possible that some of us in the room are not the age that we're seeking to target for this new exhibition. But you, whatever your age and inclinations, will be most welcome. Tonight, then, our speaker is our very own Christopher Mulvey, Professor Christopher Mulvey. Emeritus Professor of English here at the University of Winchester and a trustee of the English Project. Many of you know him, many of you have read his works. He's written uh, lots and lots of articles and books, including Anglo American Landscapes, From Smollett to James, Transatlantic Manners, and many more. In 2013, Chris and I collaborated on a history of the English language in 100 places. If for any reason it's not yet on your bookshelf, I can strongly uh, recommend it. And uh, the second place along the way in our journey is Canterbury. Uh, and it's the year 602 and the adoption of the Roman alphabet, all occasioned indirectly because of the arrival of Christianity, which you'll remember from 597 and the history books uh, is when that began. But let's not get beyond ourselves. Tonight's talk will ask and answer this question. What happened to Kentish, and why don't schools teach it? The English language in Kent from 597 to 2022. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm Winchester welcome to Professor Christopher Mulvey. Thank you, Bill, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Well, I think the first question must be, why Kent? Um, I want, I'm working through a history of the English language in various counties, and some count, all counties are equal, but some are more equal than others. Uh, and uh, the counties that are more equal than others are Kent, uh, Hampshire, Staffordshire, and Northumbria. Uh, and those are the counties uh, which were originally kingdoms uh, in which the English language was first written down in the Roman script. And as a result, that enabled us to start studying them. Um, and so, but the story of, um, of, the, of, the, of Kent... And, and what we want to talk about actually starts long before the West Germanics, the Dukes, arrived in Kent. Um, and our first sort of a term, I think, uh, of knowledge of Kent is uh, 555 BC when Julius Caesar arrived with an army and slapped straight up against the fortified stronghold of the Cantii at a place called Cantium. And we call that Canterbury now. Um, so that's our first knowledge of the name Cantium, which now is pronounced Kent. 
I think it's pretty remarkable actually that uh, the, na the word that Caesar had he didn't give it, he took it I mean he, met, he saw, he called it the kingdom of the Cantii and, and uh, we still are using that term uh, and that's because uh, it was a Britonic uh, kingdom um, Caesar called them barbarians um, <laughs> but then the Romans called everybody barbarians except the Greeks and then the Greeks called the Romans barbarians and I, so I think that's a very satisfactory situation um, what is <coughs> I think quite remarkable about uh, Kent um, is partly because it's the first place where we get the English language written in a Roman script but um, more than that uh, and earlier than that in a linguistic point of view is the fact that we call it Kent because when the West Germanics arrived and the ones who arrived in Kent were the Jutes um, they didn't call it um, Jutland they did, we're not talking about a language or a dialect called Jutish they actually adopted the name of the people that they'd conquered um, you get a name called Kantowerericha which means a Reich or a, a kingdom of the people of Kant uh, <coughs> and that's <coughs> probably the only case where the invading we call them West Germanics before we call them the English these West Germanics when they arrived uh, took over the Britonic kingdoms and the Britonic peoples but they almost never adopted their uh, they didn't adopt their words there are so few Britonic words in the English language they English has borrowed thousands, hundreds of thousands of words but there's only a very few that come from uh, the original language that was being spoken right across <coughs> the Brit Britonic area um, for instance the, uh, the name Brock for a badger or Ouse or Arvon those are Celtic words and Kent is probably a Celtic word and if, if it's thought that it might mean corner and if you look at the map from your point of view it would be like that I think from my point of view like that uh, you can see that Kent or Kant is a corner um, its boundaries are set by the river Estu Estu Tem the Thames Estuary <coughs> by the um, North Sea and by the Channel and actually the boundaries of the county of Kent the Kingdom of Kent have hardly varied since the time of Caesar and this gives us the oldest county of the very many counties I think there are 72 counties in the United Kingdom and about 48 in, um, in England itself uh, and by the way the number of counties varies a lot because counties come and go my own county Surrey I call myself, when I used to live in America they say where do you come from I'd say Surrey they say there's no need to apologize Surrey has been horribly cut up actually and most of it gone inside the M25 but if we look at Kent we've got uh, a kingdom and a county which has got pretty much the same boundaries except towards the west um, where, where it bounds with West Sussex and Wessex that's varied a little bit but the shape of Kent is pretty, uh, is, is pretty ancient so it's the oldest of our counties I think it's fair to say with old boundaries uh, the word Kent probably might mean corner might not um, one of the things that the Dukes did when they arrived in this corner they, they were pretty capable despite being called uh, barbarians again by the Romans uh, they were good metallurgists they had writing uh, they had masonry uh, and they had a number of different skills they weren't uh, uh, by any means uh, incompetent people very competent people and very easily overcame the Britonics <coughs> they quickly expanded their numbers but they couldn't expand uh, obviously bounded by the Thames and the, and the sea um, they couldn't expand west either because they came up against the South Saxons and beyond them the West Saxons so they went along the coast and they found uh, the Isle of Wight very nice place where I spent a number of pleasant holidays but um, they immediately possessed it it was that it, for some reason the West Saxons had not possessed it it was inhabited by Britonic and the Dukes took over uh, and uh, we'll come back to that uh, at a later point uh, just keep it in mind and they also um, crossed over the Solent it wasn't called the Solent crossed over the Solent and took a strip of uh, southern Hampshire between Southampton and Portsmouth and inhabited that but quickly that sort of got lost in the record as indeed the Dukes did because the great kingdom of this uh, that emerged in Old England was of course uh, the kingdom of King Alfred Wessex um, 
kingdom of Kent was subdued I think about the year of 700 becomes a county of the kingdom of Wessex um, it's interesting to think that there was originally seven uh, when the Germanics arrived they created kingdoms um, and then there were initially seven kingdoms and then there were four kingdoms and there were, well, then there was one kingdom uh, because while when they finished fighting uh, not uh, overwhelming the Britonics um, then they created their seven kingdoms and then uh, they began to fight among themselves why Kent is interesting and why Northumberland because in those four kingdoms become counties you had kings who told their monks to start writing in English so though there were many dialects of Old English between 450 and should we say 1150 we have only evidence of four dialects which we might even call royal dialects now I think that Kent is a particularly royal dialect or it's not a generalised term because of the next step and stage in the history of the English language in Kent um, that's already a date mentioned by Bill 597 uh, what was happening at the end of the, uh, the, the the kingdom of Kent had set itself up and it was pretty strong and there was a King Ethelbert and he wanted into Europe he was so different from Nigel Farage <laughs> he, he really thought why did he want into Europe well they were, they were, they were worshippers of Thor not of Christ and as a result the, 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 the Frankish kingdoms the Germanic kingdoms and all the way who had become Christian wouldn't really deal with them uh, they would deal with them at a sort of swords point um, and, and there was trading and what have you but he realised that to really get working with Western Europe um, he needed some, there were two things he needed, he needed Christianity and he needed not the kind of writing that, he, that his people had brought with them from West Europe, from, from Jutland, which is called runic writing, they needed to write as the Romans wrote, so they could then interchange and be part of a very much larger, very rich community. Um, his first move was to marry a, a, a Christian and he went across the channel I probably didn't actually go across but sent people across to bring a princess called Bertha um, who was a Christian and she um, uh, she was she's called French but actually she was Frank and that means that she probably was speaking a Germanic a variation of Germanic language before the French complete or the Franks became the French to start to talk French that's another lecture which I won't be able to give because I'm not an ex expert in French though I love the language um, King Ethelbert then married Queen Bertha and, and then uh, Pope Gregory saw this as a fantastic opportunity for what was called the reconversion of Britannia we're not using the term England yet and people in Rome saw it as the Roman province that had been abandoned in 410 um, and, that, and then had become pagan uh, and this was a great sorrow <laughs> to the people of Rome and they thought right well now we have a Christian queen and we have a, obviously a willing king Ethelbert and so they sent along that party of uh, Benedictine monks led by us, uh, 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 Augustine by Augustine who becomes Saint Augustine um, to arrive and he like Caesar landed in, in Cantium but not with the same kind of uh, I mean uh, when Caesar arrived you did what he said um, with the arrival of St. Augustine he was welcomed he, uh, and very quick because of the Queen uh, uh, built a chapel and built, a conv uh, uh, built a, an abbey and then it was within five years that Ethelbert sort of saw what was happening and he turned to Augustine and I don't know what language he spoke to him in but anyway they were very good at languages and he said I want you to write down my laws in my language I doubt whether he called it English it wasn't until Alfred that it gets to be called English but um, Ethelbert wanted his laws written down and so uh, the, the Augustine and his monks said yes I mean, that's for, and they were pleased to do this I suspect um, they started out by matching the Roman uh, alphabet to the Germanic sounds they were Italic speakers though. Latin is an Italic language they were actually speaking Italian by what we would call Italian they matched 23 of the Germanic sounds that they were hearing talked talk by these Kentish people uh, to straight up um, Roman letters A, B, C actually would be given us a good start but then they came across five sounds that they didn't really recognize um, w, th, th, and so, and yod. so 
they said, well, we don't have sounds for these. <coughs> so some of the um, Jews must have said, well, we do. Um, in, uh, in, in the uh, runic language, these, have, these are the sounds. And so they produced a series of five, uh, introduced a series of five runic letters into the Roman alphabet. It was the French monks in 1066 who said, we're not having to do with these um, and just use Roman script. And so they've gone. But you, you, it is preserved in those shop signs that say, ye oldie greeny manny. Um, and the ye is actually a th, it's a thorn, it's a, th it's a the sound. And it was that th that you Italians and the Romans didn't use, uh, t which the French rendered as a th. But then they also rendered, the French render a w as ou. <laughs> and we w uh, use it as a w. So there's a, uh, alphabets vary. Now, um, that I think is King uh, Ethelbert's great gift to all of us reading English. It's his alphabet that we're using. Um, those 23 letters plus a few more added in by the French. Um, and by the way, in, when, when they wrote down the laws of Ethelbert, uh, there was a wonderful match between the spelling and the sound, which has been disastrously lost in the last 1500 years. English really is not a, 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 a hardly spelt phonetically, it's more ideographic, ideographic. Now, what is the, 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 uh, the book that was written, which is, uh, was not, not called, it was called The Laws of Ethelbert, um, and they must have been listening to people talk, speaking it, um, because it, I don't believe it was written in runes, um, and so then it was transcribed by the monks. Um, it's uh, the great gift, uh, because it's not only the alphabet, but it's the first, uh, first writing in any Germanic language of law, and we might say it's almost the beginning of English prose. We can now look at what Old Kentish looked like. That according to the experts, the great scholars of the 19th century, there's not enough in this book, it's not that huge, to tell, fully tell what was the grammar of Old Kentish. But we can see that it's a Germanic language, it's got seven different kinds of nouns, it's got three grammatic genders like Latin uh, and German, or French has got two now. Uh, that means you say the moon is feminine, but in Latin German, the moon is not masculine. And in English, it's neither, it's an it. Um, so we have logical grammar, uh, uh, logical gender. They have what's called grammatical gender. There are two classes of adjectives. <coughs> there are two kinds of verbs, and we still have those two kinds of verbs. We have ring, rang, run where you change the um, tense by changing the center of the word, or you have weak verbs like love, uh, love, loving love. Um, something which is quite, they had Germanic word order, subject verb, uh, uh, that would be uh, subject object verb rather than subject verb object, <laughs> rather than subject verb object. Um, and the thing that's remarkable about that language is that um, it has almost no loan words in it at all. Um, as I'm talking to you now, um, I have a vocabulary which used to be said was 50,000 words, but uh, Google is now saying that those of us who go to university have even more than 50,000 words. But of my 50,000 words, 10,000 of them will be Germanic in origin. Um, please sit down if you want to sit down. Um, <coughs> 10,000 would be Germanic and those would be really scaffolding words and the is um, uh, uh, when and so on um, and some basic uh, nouns like mother, father, brother um, but 40,000 of the words that I'm using to give this lecture well I won't use it's not 40,000 words long it's 10,000 words long but of those 40,000 words in my vocabulary would have originated from um, uh, either directly from Latin or indirectly from Latin by way of French. So that's Old Kentish. It's a completely foreign language. It would take you 10, not 10 years, it takes you two. If you're really good at languages, you can learn it in a year. It took me two uh, years to learn how to read Old English, and now I've forgotten. <laughs> um, so it's a foreign language but if we move on let's move on uh, 
from uh, one of the dates I'll give for Old Kentish are 450 to 1150. 450, the putative arrival of the West Saxons, uh, the West Germanics in in uh, uh, in Britannia. 1150. Um, well, 1066 is the crucifying <laughs> moment for the English language. Um, and English begins to peter out as a written language, but never completely. But by 1150, we have very, very few records in English. Um, it's all in French and Latin. There's tons of records of England, but they're in French and Latin. Um, but by, uh, let's move forward to Middle, uh, middle Kentish now. Um, we talk about Middle English, uh, we talk about Old English, Middle English, Modern English. And the dates are 450 to 1150 for Old English. Uh, 1150 to 1500 for Middle English, 1500 to, um, to, to 2020, uh, to what, 2022 for Modern English. And those three, date, three divisions will work for, for any dialect of English. So we can talk about Old Kentish, Middle Kentish, and Modern Kentish. Um, we have a very good record of Middle Kentish, uh, and it comes from the year 1340. Uh, and what's quite interesting is that there are very few records of Old Kentish. Um, it seems to have sort of been pushed aside, pushed aside of course by the West Saxons, because once they'd invaded and turned the kingdom into a county, they never wrote in Kentish, and all the records are written in West Saxon. Uh, but it, it continued, and there were people who knew it and wrote it, and then we find in 1340, a priest sets out to write a whole book which he translates from the French in, in Kentish. Well, he, I don't know what he would call it. Actually. He probably called it in English by then. Um, we're, I'm going to call it Middle Kentish. Um, and he calls his book um, The Aeon Bite of Inuit. Uh, and it's Father Michael calls himself Dan Michael, uh, which means like Dom or Dominus. He's a priest. Um, and he writes his book in English because he wants Kentish men and women to read it. So there must have been a population of people who could read English but couldn't read Latin. And that, that's I've never heard about too much and needs to be looked into, but that's the audience for whom he was writing. We see that Middle Kentish has changed hugely from Old Kentish in that sort of period between that book from uh, um, the year 1602 to the book in 1340. That's a very long time and language constantly changes. Um, and there had been huge changes by the arrival of the Danes and to, to, to live in the Dane law, and then the arrival of the French. But by the way, Kent had been largely protected from that. Kent was never part of the Dane law, and the Danes never ruled in Kent. Um, and also, <coughs> when the French arrived, they basically, the Norman French they are, um, they were working with, first of all, in Winchester, then in London, and they didn't really take a great deal of note of Kent. And the Kentish had become a language not used by uh, the, the, the learned or by the uh, powerful, uh, but of course it was spoken by the people, and Dan Michael could speak it, and so he translates this French book, which in French is called La Somme des Vies et des Vertus, uh, translates it into English, not a direct translation. He doesn't count, translate it as the sum of vices and virtues, but the Aeon Bite of Inuit. A fantastic piece of language, I think, that I, I come on to it. There are many changes in the book, you can see. Um, there's not so many changes in Kentish as there was in Mercian, or what I would call Chaucer's English. Chaucer's English had changed so much that by, and he was writing 40 years later, 1340, and it's seems to me it takes you about two hours to get into Chaucer, not two years. <laughs> with, with Kentish you would take quite a long time, with Vlock you wouldn't understand. Grammatical gender is slowly giving way to logical gender, that's completely gone in Chaucer's English. Noun endings are disappearing, but they're still preserving, when he, talk, he talks about a bell, he calls it a bell, but when he talks about bells he calls them bellen and you'll recognize that plural in ox, oxen, child, children. Rather, that's the old Germanic plural, which is still getting German, adding an E-N. Um, there are very few French words. Whereas French words have poured into Chaucer's English, uh, and uh, because this was the uh, language of the court, the language of education, the language of the universities, and they had begun to take words. You've got people who were fluent in Latin, English, and French, and 
they were beginning to need to write about all sorts of different subjects um, uh, from which there were no words in, in English and so they took them from French and that's been going on and only stopped that way in 1945 and now we take words from American that's a different story um, there are very few French words I'm going to read you a, a, just a few um, a, a sentence from the book this book is Dan Mickles of Northgate he wrote in English of his own hand Thet Hatter, Iron Bit of Inwit, and is of the Bockhaus of St. Austin's of Canterbury. I'm not sure whether I've got the accent right, but you get the idea. <laughs> it's really different. Um, but you can also, I think, understand a lot of it. Um, and that's because there are 29 words there, and only one of them is French, unless you discount it, Justin. Um, <laughs> the word saint. All the other words are, are, are of, of Germanic origin. Now, as I've said, in Chaucer's language, you would find up to 20-30% um, of French or Latin origin. And three words stand out, which I think are wonderful. There's Aeonbite, and there's Inwit, and there's Bocchus. Now, Aeonbite means remorse, uh, but the word remorse doesn't appear in English until the year 1400. All this kind of evidence I'm getting from the Oxford English Dictionary. As my chief said, seventy or how many years ago, 1960, he said, a monument to British scholarship. Picked up a volume and nearly wept. Uh, it was such a, and I wrote, yes, he was right. Um, so remorse didn't arrive in English until 1400, um, and it seems that uh, Don Michael invented a word which is like remorse, who must been like, uh, uh, and he, uh, a and bite means again bite and remorse is again gnaw and that's what conscience does it remorsely <laughs> remorselessly gnaws into you and now inwit is inner wit conscience con cum, 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 conscientia so he uh, the word and that was a word that was already in english and uh, uh, but it arrived in the year 2025 well it might have arrived before the oed said this is when we first found it and that's what that means now we've got another word here bookhouse or bookhouse um, which a modern translation of that would be library but well, that doesn't sound at all like bookhouse but the real French word for library is not library it's not library which is a uh, library means a bookshop like patisserie or, or, or charcuterie it's where you buy books not where you store them the word they use for storing books is from Greek bibliothèque biblios book a bible book and tech building and so you've got a book building a bookhouse and it seems to me wonderful if the French hadn't come in, 19, in 1066 both Nigel Farage would be happy but also the English language would be say it would have words like bookhouse in it instead of library it would have inwit instead of consciousness it would have aeonbite instead of remorse now we don't have that and we particularly don't have it in our written language and that's down to some extent you can say to a Kentish man oh dear um, a man called William Caxton you all know who William Caxton is he's a pretty interesting man because he was born in Kent we don't know quite where he was born in Kent in 1420 um, and he died in Westminster in 1492 um, and he is the first person to print a book in English he did it actually in Flanders he'd gone over it was I mean when printing came out in, in with Gutenberg in what is it <laughs> I forgot the date now 1464 it was just like the opening up of the internet young men poured into that they saw you could make money out of this there was a huge by 1500 there are a million books um, um, the, the printing was so great that they doubled and tripled the manuscripts within 40 years astonishing Caxton was a businessman worked for, uh, from Kent working in, in, in Flanders and he picked he went and got himself trained um, in a printing shop then he must have had enough money to get the kit to do printing and then he printed a book which he translated from French uh, and he translated it into English it's called the Recoy of the Histories of Troy that's almost like French it's le Recoy uh, des histoires de Troyes uh, Recoy is a French word meaning anthology and he must have thought well, we haven't got a word like anthology in English so he just used the French word knowing that his readers would recognize it easily enough 
and that's why words were streaming into English because you're dealing with a really an Ilani group which are tri trilingual that in French and English and a large group of people who were um, anybody with any degree of power or education or money could speak French and English um, so he took his printing press from Flanders and then he came but he didn't go to Canterbury and he didn't go to London he went to Westminster I'm not going to ask you why because this is not the same class uh, I'm going to tell you the answer Canterbury would have why would he go to Canterbury um, but he didn't because he wasn't going to translate the, his books into Kentish and he didn't go to London because he wasn't going to translate them into Essexian or which we now call Cockney and why not because um, the fashionable centre the learned centre was already Westminster Westminster English the, the, the derivative of which I'm talking now and I've no doubt most of you talk so as a sensible businessman he translated it into the language of the English court uh, which is a derivative of Mercian uh, and that's what makes it so easy when you look at the printed page of his book it's very difficult to read but as soon as it's taken out of its old gothic lettering and given modern spelling and punctuation it's as easy to read as pi so what happened to Kent? nobody was pr printing in Kent nobody seems to have been writing but people were talking Kentish that's the point all these dialects continued no matter what was happening at the higher level um, and we Get, we can begin to get an idea of what Kent, what, how people were talking in Kent, uh, because um, in 1735, uh, a, a, a Dr. Samuel Pegg, who came actually from Derbyshire, but he'd been to Cambridge and become a, uh, become a, a, a clergyman, and he got a living in Godmanshire, um, in, in, in Kent, about 12 miles from Canterbury, and he was intrigued by the way that his parishioners talked. He thought it was extraordinary. They just didn't talk like him. And he began to write down all the things. He, he completed a very substantial manuscript, which was then picked up by another sort of learned clergyman, but he, um, Richard Morris, in the 19th century. Um, and I think he uh, produced a version of that uh, uh, book, of, of Pegg's book, in about 1860, 1870. Um, Pegg called all these peculiar ways of talking uh, Kentisisms um, and, uh, and, and Morris called them Kentisms which would probably be our way that we say now we talk about um, they both pointed out that the people in Kent didn't say put your hat on they said put your hot hat at and they talked about not in the evening but an evening and they didn't talk about in the, uh, in the summer but a summer now of those phrases, I think one that we still would recognise, I go to I go to France a summer. And that would make that would mean in the summer. And it's just a trace of uh, of that old uh, that uh, that older language. What both of these clergy recognised was there was an overlap with Sussex, and Morris said it even to Wiltshire. And somebody listening to his lecture, when he read it read out this lecture, you can get it online. Um, Somebody said, uh, wrote in to say, I, I've listened to what you have to say about all these particular uh, sayings from um, Kent, and I've heard all of them in the Isle of Wight. And you remember that Bede said that Kent, the Dukes had gone to the Isle of Wight, and so the dialect had still continued, it was still to be heard. Uh, really, you have to say mainly by people who didn't go to school. It's school that wrecks, wrecks the dialects of England. And I'll talk a lot about that now because our dialects are actually destroyed by education. And a weird thing had happened in English language, uh, in England I should say really, between 1700 and 1800. It, during those, in that hundred years, a proper way of speaking, I use proper not for quotation marks, had emerged. In 1700 there seems to have been no particular dialect that was particularly more... Uh, elegant in it or, 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 or superior to any other but by 1800 it's pretty clear that there were there's a novel written in 1812 in which the um, two aristocratic women are talking about an Irish woman who's also an aristocrat and they say she doesn't speak pure English she speaks pure Cockney and they mean anything that's not our English is Cockney what the aristocrats of, Win of Westminster 
the language they hated most was the local one of the city of London and that was really awful for them. That's Cockney. And there's a prejudice against Cockney to this day. One of the most magnificent forms of the English language. Not a thing wrong with it. What had happened though in that 1800 was there had been an incredible improvement in the condition of English roads. Um, the English were the first to really link all their cities with good, with Macadam roads. Robert Macadam had showed people how to make roads. Um, it's layers of, layers of different... Uh, I used to write about this for another book. <laughs> Layers of different graded stone then covered with tarmac from Macadam. Um, and that meant the people could start not just uh, the, uh, the, the men riding to London, but they could create coaches which would comfortably carry their wives and children. And so began the London season. And they began to flock from all over England to the city of, uh, not the city of London, the city of Westminster, let me be careful to say, and the most important people were presented at the court of St. James. And then became the custom of present, they went to London for the season, for parties, for balls, for receptions, for tea parties, for dinners, and this, that, and the other. Um, and then for games, too, for rowing, and for Henley, and for Ascot, and that, not Wimbledon, but Wimbledon would have been included. Um, that all sounds like leisure, and it was. But the business, there was a business here. The business was marriage. I bring my eligible young boy and girl and meet your eligible one. But eligibility, how do you judge that? We don't want you to be, you know, some awful waster. Um, so the, initially, it was the court of St. James. If you were, a, 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 you were made your opening, um, which came to be called your debut um, at the court of St. James, then that's the kind of family, what Mrs. Thatcher would call our kind of people, although she wasn't that kind of person. Um, anyway, where was I? Um, by uh, 1800, we had the word debutante appearing, and it's mainly applied to the young girls. So the, um, there were girls until 21 when they became women, but the age of 18 when they were 16 to 18 when they were presented. Um, that was fine, debutantes, but the marriage market was rather narrow if you only had the people who were presented at the court of St. James and they were tons of wealthy gentry families terribly respectable and terribly wealthy who weren't presented so how did you know whether they were one of us? Well of course dress counted, there were dress code emerged and a manners code, I mean you didn't pick your nose or scratch yourself at table and if you did you weren't one of us. So there began a huge change in manners and and and, and uh, um, and dress um, and also you had to be able to dance you, no longer did you have to sing in the 17th century you would be able to sing but they, they sort of dispensed with that um, but they also had began to have a much more a much more emphatic way of distinguishing our, our group from your group and that was by speech and so between 1700 and 1800 emerged an upper class way of speaking and so those two ladies could say of that Irish woman who was an aristocrat herself, she doesn't speak pure English, she speaks pure Cockney, which she didn't. Um, when you have, so then there was a group below this, so the, the white gentry who wanted their boys and girls to be able to speak like the aristocrats. And the vehicle for that were the public schools. And it's pretty evident in 1868, there's a public school act of parliament um, and they named the great schools of Charterhouse, Eton, Harrow, Rugby, Shrewsbury, Westminster, and Winchester. Um, they have, uh, have uh, also they pleaded to Parliament, a uh, sought from Parliament, the, the change in their charters. They were bound by ch charters of their foundation to accept only um, non-fee paying boys, um, scholarship boys. Well, they'd already started to take a lot of fee paying boys, so they wanted to legalize their situation. And so the, this, this act, the Public Schools Act of uh, 1868, enabled them to actually accept fee paying boys. And so some of the schools like Eton would actually take in a thousand boys now, paying a colossal amount of money, and it became a really good trade. Um, and at the same time, they allowed these private schools become private to continue to call themselves public schools. 
to the absolute understanding of the people in England and to the bafflement of the rest of the world. Um, there were seven named great schools and quickly five more joined them in an association and that association of great schools became in 1865 an association of public schools and numbered 64 so the number had gone up I mean it's a very profitable business um, actually today I see on the website um, there are 361 public schools that are private schools um, now what was the advantage of such a school well if you sent your boy to such a school uh, however he taught uh, when he left home uh, he went to school at the age of 13 by Christmas he would be talking like a gentleman otherwise he would be dead I mean, they didn't um, hear what they did to people at Winchester School um, awful so the children, the children quickly adapt at the age of 13 um, there's good uh, Freudian reason not Freudian reason um, Darwinian reasons for the adaptability of children um, you need to be able to talk to your mate you need, and you can change I've got the grandchildren who speak English, Arabic and French um, I only speak English um, but after puberty you lose that capacity because you, you're presumed to be able to speak to your partner um, the public schools become private schools become public schools by 1900 the accent was called a public school accent and that's what you were paying for in, in 1926 there was a, a linguist called Daniel Jones who, wanted to, who wrote a book called English Pronouncing Dictionary and he didn't like this term public school accent it seemed to him to be amateur and somehow insidious and vidious and so he said he, would, he called it received pronunciation and that was felt to be less elite although it's an interesting received by whom you might ask well received by people like us or people like you forget <laughs> about me um, then in 1954 another linguist Alan Ross noted that the upper class had moved up a register in their voice so you've got the 6% start sounding like received pronunciation um, and that standard uh, uh, pronunciation now is called British Standard English that's what uh, and that's what's used to give us six, 600,000 pronunciations in the OED now let's, we need to look a little bit I'm going to use some statistics now rather wildly um, from 2011 UK census I'm going to use some figures from the Department of Education and I'm going to use some figures from Kent County Council to try to find out who speaks what in Kent um, Kent County Council tell us that there are one and a half million plus and that plus is quite important people living in Kent in 2011 I expect there are a lot more now but the figures will sort of work out the Department of Education say 30% of those uh, the children of these people will leave school at the age of 16 then it says another 70% will leave school at the age of uh, 18 but that 70% is divided into two groups now let's look at those groups now if you, if you live in, if not live in Tonbridge, but if you want to send your boy, and it's a boys' school, to Tonbridge School in Tonbridge, Kent, it's going to cost you, let me look at eye watering, £42,000 uh, a year. I translated that the other day into dollars and it was 50000 but I think today it's $42,000. <laughs> We've reached what you would call it, equity or parity. Um, but it, and there are seven more public schools, none of them as expensive as Tonbridge, but those children will come out speaking with a U, uh, URP accent um, and it will be marked by what we call standard English grammar the grammar that you speak that I'm using now um, and we can talk about a lot but that's another lecture um, now not all the children at Tom, boys at Tonbridge School will be living in Kent they will come from all over England but that's the point about this dialect this is not called a dialect anymore it's called a sociolect it's a voice of a a group of 5% or 6% of the population that is not, not to do with region at all but is to do with class and money now let's look at the uh, it took 6% out of that 70% so we've now got 64% now if you send your girl to Tunbridge Grammar School and it's a girls school it'll cost you nothing and that's very nice too um, and she will come out with a British standard it's called a British standard uh, 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 pronunciation British standard English 
Um, and she will talk standard English grammar. And that means no double negatives, no double comparatives, no split infinitives, and probably are not ending her sentences with prepositions. Those are the Johnsonian rules taken from the 17th century Latinist who said English is so rotten, it needs to be corrected, it affects its infinitives, and you don't do that. All the things you don't do in Latin, you mustn't do. You've got five minutes to go? <laughs> okay, right. Uh, let me hop along. Um, there's another group, 30% of people who leave school at 16. Um, they will uh, have local accents and they will follow the Germanic bent of the Jews. No Latinate uh, usages. Um, there will be about half a million of such people and a million of the previous. But we've got to subtract a number of groups. Kent is always being invaded by Londoners people like us, people like you and they keep coming in and the real Kenters don't like us um, they call us the Down From London Brigade, the DLF Brigade and Kent journalists every year write an article and say these people are, are destroying the old Kentish language uh, which you can find apparently in, the, in, the rural, in rural Kent uh, a Kent uh, Dr. David Horsby University of Kent socio linguist says there's no such thing as a Kentish accent. Well, maybe. I'm not sure about that. Um, what, uh, he, he's right, of course. There's no single Kentish accent. But if the ke real Kenters will test you. What's a pismire, they say? You don't know. It's an ant. What's a Dumbledore? Oh, I know what that is. That's a headmaster of Hogwarts. No, it's not. It's actually a bumblebee. Rowling is a genius. Um, uh, will you put those uh, will you put that uh, spade and fork in the lodge? Well, oh, no, lodge is shed in old in old Kentish or modern Kentish. Um, will you give me the keys, not the car keys? They mean sycamore um, seeds. And can you hear that yaffle? What? It's a green woodpecker. Of all those words, the only one that's only heard in Kent is yaffle, a green woodpecker. But the rest are heard all the way along southern England. But they are native. Kent. They've come out of Jutish, they've come out of Old Kentish. And also the rotic R, which we associate with, uh, I like my cider from the, my farm, heard in rural, uh, well, <laughs> rural Devon, but also it's to be heard in rural Kent. And again, they haven't learnt it from the West Country, uh, it's native. Now, London has invaded in another way, and it's brought in two uh, modern accents. Uh, since, second, since the Second World War, since 1960, uh, 60, uh, 1945. Um, there are two versions of Cockney. A Cockney which ma matches Caribbean English. The Windrush arrived in 1947, and since before, by 1970, there were 500,000 West Indians living, uh, Caribbean uh, West Indians living in, um, uh, in England. A large, huge populations in London when these people sent their children to school, they met white children talking Cockney, they were talking British Caribbean, and the two groups, instead of one dominated, they merged to produce something now called multicultural London English. There was another blended English, and this is called estuary English, which is Cockney plus modern, plus standard British grammar. I'm going to skip over here. Um, what happened now was that the Beatles had made, made it elegant to talk rotten, you know, talk scouse. They came to London, instead of like Joan Bakewell or Kate Adie uh, normalizing on the Raga and the upper classes, they just continued to speak as they talked talk at school, as they'd spoken at home. Um, people, instead of with the public school accent, they talked up. Now they began to talk down. It's called estuarium. Um, I've got to go faster now. Tracy Emin is an estuarian speaker. Well, you're going to say to me she was born in Croydon. Well, she was. But she, was, she grew up in Margate in Kent. She went to Medway College of Design and Maidstone College of Art. It might not be the accent and the dialect that everybody wants to hear all the time, but I'm not going to stop talking. <laughs> I don't know what that sounds like, Tracy Emin. But I mean, that's it. It's, um, she will not talk um, uh, in, in, you know. She's a poet of Kent. I'm going to read you a poem. I lay here. I lay here with my head buried in the pillow. I love you. I want you to love me. You love me. Your head buried 
deep inside of me. And that's all we can get at that time unless you pay $5,000. <laughs> It's, it's secured it on some kind of strange website. I think it's what they call an NF, uh, NFT, uh, a non-fungible token poem. Um, well, I could say more, but I won't. I'll end here. So what began uh, with the English spoken by the Dukes has ended with the English spoken by Tracy Ennin. Um, she's not a typical Kentish speaker, but there's no typical Kentish speaker. We listen to about seven different dialects, and there's probably more. The, in the oldest of English counties, the English language has been evolving for 15 centuries. Old Kentish has been evolved, invaded, marginalized, and often despised. But it has and it's received no support from education and cultural resources. But it does appear that some traces of the Dukes can still be heard in the land that the Dukes themselves, that the Dukes took from the Kenti E the land that the Dukes strangely named Kent. Thank you very much. Chris, that was absolutely uh, wonderful. Thank you. Uh, are you happy to take a few questions? And if so, would you like to stay there? And uh, I'm a bit wobbly today, so I'm going to just yes, sit okay. down, if that's all right. I'll hold on to this, because I'm a bit wobbly. And you're a bit wobbly, too. I don't know. Yeah, I'm happy to the take English questions. Project uh, trusteeship are very wobbly today. Um, who would like to uh, ask uh, Chris anything? Do please uh, uh, just tell us who you are and go for it. Chris. Mr. Seaman, I'm a man of Kent. Oh, and great. my grandparents were born in villages near Fabisham. Oh, fantastic. And they said here and there, which I always would have thought would have been West Country, but you did touch on that, didn't you? Absolutely, it's erotic R. Um, we have a strange situation with erotic R in Hampshire because uh, Portsmouth, which is fed by the A3 uh, uh, for you know, hundreds of years, has a tremendous influence of London, and London crushes erotic R. That Scotland doesn't have it. Um, but. Um, if you go to the to the west of the county, you get uh, and move towards Devon, you get a very strong rotting R. Southampton is called semi-rotic. <laughs> <laughs> to the uh, to the east, they are uh, non-rotic. To the west, you, um, there's a, a kind of a, a burring R. When I came here to Hampshire 40 years ago, you heard it a lot more. Actually, yeah. you really did. So, Thanks, but Christy. it is a natural part of it. It is natural to to Kent. You haven't and borrowed the American it. Accent come from the West Country uh, Well, a Southern American accent comes from the West Country. Yeah. I mean, there are five great accents in America, oh. um, and they are, this is another lecture. He's very good on that, actually. <laughs> <laughs> so another oh, sorry. But the fact <laughs> is, what is interesting about America, there's no single dominant accent. Um, you hear people in the Senate, they'll all be talking with standard British grammar, or might call it probably standard American grammar, uh, but they will have their own accents. Um, and there's only one accent, there are two accents which are sort of considered pretty, a bit like Cockney. That's uh, the Joysey accent. Uh, the, boy, the oily boy catches the woin. And then the hillbilly accent. Um, but uh, uh, there are at least five different ways of speaking standard American, um, and uh, one is equ equivalent to the other. They've never created the, si the sociolect that we have in England, which actually spreads all to Irish public schools and to Scots public schools, but apparently not to Welsh public schools. <laughs> um, somebody will looking confused when Chris was talking about the erotica, because I think he thought, thought he was saying erotica, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but he wasn't. Uh, uh, yes, just here. Uh, it's a comment on the erotica. Like I saw something in the Sussex in Fulham, and I can remember when I was a child, in old people, spoke with what you would associate with West Country, like definitely with the strong R. Yes. Absolutely. And then when I was teaching in Southampton, uh, in Wolfton, there was a teacher in the school called Gary Hampton, which is quite appropriate, and he had the richest and strongest accent, uh, which was joyful to hear, but it was a very thorough yes. accent. Yes, and it's unusual for a teacher. The great example of somebody who didn't change his accent is Lord Denning, <laughs> who went all the way to the High Court and the Supreme Court, I and mean, then he still spoke as a boy from Mitchell Dever. Um, uh, but that took a tremendous courage, I think, <laughs> because uh, most people don't, don't do that. I mean, uh, uh, and he also didn't normalize on the people he was with. So there may have been a... Um, the Beatles, by the way, sounded really scouse when they arrived in London in 1963 and well, what a 
great year that was. And there's also, when you may remember from Philip Larkin, when sex was invented, so <laughs> that was a lovely year. Um, but uh, uh, as they went on living in Surrey, and uh, they, you, their, their voices modified, but not deliberately. It's very difficult to maintain your accent when everybody around you is talking in a uh, British standard uh, uh, pronunciation. Thank you. Question over there. Joe. Sure. Yes. Well, why, how did we lose? Well, how did we lose uh, what's called um, grammatical gender when uh, when German didn't, and it still has it? One of the explanations is that um, it really comes from the uh, um, uh, the arrival of the French um, in in uh, so much French was being spoken, and so many people were bilingual that they, they, you know, it, the, the loon is, is, is feminine, but the moon is masculine. And it, it was in that period between um, 1150 and 1500 that the, the, um, the gendered nouns disappeared and became logical gender. And the thought is that the influence of French, which is massive on English, I mean, we have our word words coming from French, most of our words come from French, um, our spelling has been French. Look at the word queen beautifully spelt by those people in 1602 as C-W-E-N Quen uh, when the French saw this W they, put, they replaced it with Q-U <laughs> so um, there was a, a, a modulation, a normalization um, and then um, with, we, just, we lost the endings of our words and with the losing of the ending of our words for inflection um, you also lose gender, and so we, and it makes English a relatively easy, easier language to learn. Sorry, I couldn't. Yeah. Dutch is not gender. Yeah, and, um, well, I don't know. I mean, where, where <laughs> I don't know Dutch. <laughs> um, all Dutch people speak brilliant English better than we do, of course. But the thing is, um, these th their um, language uh, left on its own uh, evolves very, very slowly. And the language which is close to Jutish or to to uh, West Saxon is actually Frisian, um, that northern uh, northern province of of Netherlands, um, where there's been almost which is so isolated uh, that the language. If you listen to people, they say or like 20, 30 yards away you think they're speaking English it's only when you get to them you realise you don't quite understand it now English is the most changed I would imagine that Dutch must have had some tremendous influences like the Spanish for instance mm -hmm. um, so there will be some linguistic influence coming in which can make a huge change but I, don't, I can't speak about Dutch question right at the back uh, topical but not relevant to change I never heard that she did, and I only realised when I heard that one of the when she was talking about the age of thirteen, she had a really uh, uh, a, 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 a U accent. Um, I imagine that um, she uh, you, you can you can gently modify, and I think what happened is she gently modified it without any real effort. Somebody who did um, put an effort into it, I don't know whether I've already mentioned this joke, but I must tell it two or three times. Um, is uh, George Osborne who when he became Chancellor in uh, 20, uh, 2012, was it, or whatever, um, he was found to be suffering uh, in Parliament, uh, people listening to him, not in Parliament maybe, but from what's called uh, uh, irritable vowel syndrome. <laughs> 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 and he was told, you know, knock it back a bit. And he, he actually, within two years, had, you, you don't need to do much. Two people who are using uh, uh, UR, uh, URP are... Uh, um, uh, Johnson, Boris Johnson and David Cameron and they, they never seem to uh, generate a, a, a particular antipathy uh, which um, somebody like Osborne I tell you who really does do it Discuss. Well, no no I, I'm not talking politically I'm talking linguistically I mean, um, I, I've never heard that people I mean 
he, he's a very popular speaker, is Johnson, but he actually has a, 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 a URP accent. Um, uh, somebody who really overdoes it, and, uh, and this is not only linguistically, I'm not talking politically, is Jacob rees mogg <laughs> who really goes out of his way to make a set to teeth on it. Just time for a couple more questions, sir. Yes, um, two things. The first is that in Kennedy's terms, we will not forget Edward Heath in some of his his songs for Val. Val. Yeah. Um, but to come back to that point, um, I'm an example of a very hybridized accent because of my birth and upbringing in the States and living here for 50 years. Um, but I wound up uh, in my teaching career uh, teaching linguistics. Um, and one of the things that came as a surprise to me is that that business about how far you adapt is at least in part, for some people, physiological. It's the makeup of your brain. Yeah. And the, the, the simple way of putting it is that some people are wired to be sponges and they absorb what's around them, sometimes almost minute by minute. Mm -hmm. Other people, it's stones and they are resistant. It's yeah. classic case study of a stone was uh, a man who left Tyneside in the 1930s as, I think, a six-year-old or a five-year-old as a 10-pound palm and went to Australia. And when they reported him in the 1980s in his old age, you thought he had just stepped off the plane from Newcastle. Both, he was a stone, whereas I and a, a lot yes, of people yeah. are sponges. And and th that that's very much, I mean, yeah, it, that's very much to do with the uh, capacity of your brain to, to use language, Bocca's region. Um, and some, uh, as I mentioned before, children can pick up languages with the greatest of ease. They're using a huge amount of their brain to do it. There's a huge amount of effort. It's not, I mean, it's not an effort they realize, but there's a huge amount of, 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 of biological energy going into language. And then at the age of puberty, you start to lose that. Now, some people never lose it. I mean, George Borrow ended up by learning 40 different languages. And every year, he was, you know, took the Bible to Spain. And he, if he wanted to learn a new language, he'd, get a, he'd pick up a Hungarian Bible. And he said, I never lose my place, because I could just look, say it's Josiah 12, 21. And I know what it is. Um, and so he'd learn the language every year. And that is a capacity that most of us lose at puberty. And I suppose there must be an opposite <laughs> syndrome, like the man who, um, I mean, when I lived in America for 15 years, my, I always say New York City with a D. I mean, I lived there, I have to, <laughs> New York City sounds ridiculous. <laughs> um, so you, you, you do normalize, but I, I guess that's a, a, you know, a biological um, variation, and some people do normalize, some people don't normalize. Um, and, uh, that's the way it goes. It, I mean, language is not a cultural phenomenon. It's a biological phenomenon. That, otherwise, thank God it isn't. Because um, if it were culture, I mean, look at the way we teach French. I did French for about five or six years, ten years. And I can, I can read it now. Uh, because when I retired, I thought, when I go to, you know, to meet St. Peter, he said, well, can you talk French, Christopher? <laughs> I said, well, not really. So I thought, well, I'd better read it at least. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I think it's certainly not. <laughs> Thank you, Chris. One more question, if anybody would like to. Uh, two, yeah, one here and then one there, please. Thank you. Um, there, what about the great vowel change? What, what I, I read something that there was a kind of such a switch across the country that it almost looked like a sudden thing. Can it's an incredible thing, yes. Yeah. Can you, is there time to touch on that? Yes, I mean, that's a whole lecture there. <laughs> but, um, J just the first paragraph. Then. All right. <laughs> well, it took place, in effect, between 1420 and 1492, uh, because um, those are the dates of William Caxton. Uh, William Caxton, uh, when he came back to England and started to print, he used a spelling that was current before the Great Vowel Change. Um, and he then said, he came along and he came back to England. He said, England's the most strange country where the language changes. It's ephemeral, it's insubstantial. He seems to be the first person, certainly in England, maybe in the world, to, re to recognize that languages change. And he recognized it because he had to decide on a spelling for his words. Unfortunately, if he'd chosen to do the spelling in 1500, our language would be much more... Uh, 
that there would be a better isomorphic fit, as it's called. But um, that change took place from the time they now think of the, um, the, the, the uh, what's the great death called? No, is it called the great death? Black death. Black death. Black death. <laughs> yes. um, the black death uh, really changed the basis of English labor. Labor peasants, rather than being in excess, became in demand. And there was a huge labor loss in, in the southern counties and men and women streamed from the north to the south and it seems to be with that huge movement there was one of those what I call normalizations that we had with British Caribbean and Cockney, uh, Cockney. Um, and that may, that may have been what precipitated that change a change in speech can take place incredibly quickly because it's by word of mouth one of the quickest pieces of news <laughs> was the cutting off of the head of King uh, 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 Louis the Fourteenth, the Fourteenth, the Sixteenth. Sorry, um, it was shouted from field to field across France. It was such a piece of news, and it reached you know Marseille within 24 hours. And there was no way, that, you know, people were just so astonished. Um, New Zealand changed its accent within about five or six years, and uh, you know how they say instead of sex, sex, they say sex. Um, and they have all sorts of funny pronunciations. I'm wrong to say they're funny, they're wonderful. Um, but that change took place within about 10 years. And that was before bro broadcast, because word of mouth. And we saw that happening in London, where all those aristocrats decided to speak in a particular way and force anybody joining the group to talk like that. Last question, sir. Coming back to, to Kent, I think you spoke of a range of dialects within the Kentish region. Did those line up at all with the age-old division between the man of Kent and the Kentish man? Well, I think yes. Um, that's, uh, uh, um, we don't know whether uh, Taxon was a man of Kent or a Kentish man. The Kentish people divide themselves into two halves, if that, uh, depending whether you're born to the west of the Medway or the east of the Medway. Um, I don't know which it is. Which is it? The Kentish man is born to the east of Medway. The mere man of Star, I beg your pardon. The mere Kentish man to the west. Well, the, the, the ones who were born to the east of the Medway were, uh, and born in the rural uh, <coughs> area and leave school at 16 are far more likely, if we want to hear the remnant, the remnant, the, 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 the uh, <laughs> what's the word I want here remnants of, of, Ju of Jutish English you're likely to get it there because London is pressing in in its accents at multicultural and that estuarian and that is sort of eradicating uh, dialects don't disappear but they do evolve and sometimes they evolve very quickly we don't know which side of Medway William Caxton was born but he didn't do Kentish any great help <laughs> Chris, thank you so much. Um, we kind of thought you might get Nigel Farage in, but we're surprised and amused that you got Margaret Thatcher into a lecture on, on Kent. Um, we're uh, delighted to imagine uh, uh, a dialogue between you and a French-speaking uh, St. Peter. We look forward to that. I'm sure you've got lots to uh, fess up to. Uh, we love the idea of a, of a, of a non-fungible token poem. Who knows, maybe that's a fundraising idea we could use <laughs> for the English project or the Hampshire Cultural Trust, who knows. Uh, and uh, lovely word, the book house. We were in a library, then we were in a discovery centre, now we're in the art. Maybe we, we should revert to the book house. Wouldn't that be a, a radical move forwards or is it sideways or is it backwards or who cares anyway? But most importantly, will you put your hands together and thank Chris for a wonderful <laughs> Friendly, and if you want to chat to him, please do. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> 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 Thank you. It's great. A lot of fun. Yeah, a lot of fun. Uh, oh, yes.